Hello, Mighty Tigers. Remember, my favorite thing to do is to read to you. And so I'm going to read another story today. Um, this one is inspired by the spring we are having. We're having such a beautiful spring. And this is a story called The Beaver Pond. And there's the beaver sitting on top of the dam on, that he created. This is written by Alvin Tresselt, illustrated by Roger Duvoisin, I think. And so well, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to read. You think about the images that you see in your mind. Then I'll show you the illustrations and you can compare and see if what you see in your mind is what the illustrations, um, the illustrator saw too. Um, and then I also want you to think about the language that the author uses, the describing words, the adjectives. And, and see if that will improve your, reading, your writing too. The Beaver Pond by Alan Tresselt. The beavers had made the pond in the first place, here in a hidden valley, where a small stream wandered through a grove of aspen trees. The beavers built a dam. With their sharp teeth, they cut down young aspen trees to eat the bark. Then they dragged the trunks and branches to the brook for the dam. They crisscrossed the sticks just so and plastered them over with mud and stones to hold back the rushing of the stream. So here's the illustration. You can see the beavers working. And you can see down there, they're building their dam. What will happen when they stop this stream of water if it stops right there and the water keeps coming, what will happen? Larger and larger, the pond grew. You were right, it'll make a pond. And in the middle of the still water, the beavers built their domed houses with tunnels under the water so no enemies could get in. In time, green reeds sprang up along the shore. So here's what the illustrator came up with. You can see the stumps of the trees. And you can see the beavers on their domed houses. I like how the author chose domed houses. It sends a picture in my mind. <clears throat> they waved their pointy fingers in the breeze and red-winged blackbirds came to hide their nests in the rustly grasses. Rustly grasses. That's a nice way of just saying the grass that's blowing in the wind. Ducks came too, for the beaver pond was a good place for ducklings to swim and dive. Fish swam down the stream into the pond and a blue kingfisher perched on a limb to watch for fish for his dinner. Lacy winged dragonflies hovered and darted over the water. Even if you don't know what a kingfisher is, the author says, that the kingfisher perched on a limb. Well, usually birds perch, so that's a clue that it's probably a bird to watch for fish for its dinner. Maybe it's a bird that hunts for fish. So you can use context clues to figure out what these things are that the author is talking about. Oh, and there's the illustration of the kingfisher. There's the red-winged blackbird bird. There's the reeds rustling in the wind and the ducks and their ducklings. In the evening as the frogs sang their grumpy songs, the deer came with their babies to drink the water of the pond and black masked raccoons prowled the water's edge for tasty crayfish. I like the word prowled used here instead of just walked along the edge. Prowled. So that looks like they're, in my mind, they're slowly hunting for their food. Oops, and here's the colored illustration. You can see the deer, you can see the raccoons. A reflection of the moon in the water so we know it's nighttime. It didn't matter to the beavers who used their pond. There was room for everyone. And the beavers were too busy fixing the dam and repairing their houses and raising their babies to notice their neighbors. The paddling ducks the sunning turtles and the slippery green frogs sitting on lily pads meant nothing to them. But while they worked, one old beaver kept careful watch for the wolf. He worried about the soft-footed lynx, and his nose warned him of a stealthy wolverine. So we know that those animals that they were watching for, the lynx and the wolverine, that's their predators. 
And there's all the animals using that pond that the beavers created. With a thwack, his tail slapped the water and the beavers dove for the shelter of their houses. Then one by one, their heads popped up. Chirping and whistling, they discussed the danger that was past and back to work they went. While the beaver babies swam and splashed in the limpid green light of their underwater world. The limpid green light. Instead of just saying they were under the water. The author chose to really describe it to us. So there's the water level. So that's the domed part that we would see. And this is all that's going on underneath that we can't see. Isn't that interesting? Then the late summer days felt the first nip of frost and the beavers were busier than ever cutting down more and more of the young aspens. They dragged the branches into the water and buried them in the mud at the bottom of the pond. The tender bark would be their food for the bitter days of winter. Bitter days, I like that word. That adjective describes how winter can be sometimes. Here's the illustrations. The beavers busily working, preparing for winter as so many animals must do. Now is the time for the ducks and blackbirds to fly off to the Southland. The sumacs flamed scarlet, the aspens turned to gold, and the frosted reeds rattled dryly in the cold wind. Even if you don't know what a sumac is or an aspen, now we know, as the author describes the leaves changing in the fall, these are trees. The frost bit deeper and deeper into the ground as a sheet of ice spread over the top of the pond and the frogs slept deep in the mud at the bottom. The winter snows swept down, filling the hollows and covering the secret runways of field mice. The frozen earth slept under the snow. Ooh, I like that, don't you? How the author said that. The frozen earth slept under the snow. The pond slept under the ice and the beavers were safe from the wolf, the prowling lynx and the wolverine under the icy roof of the pond and the frozen domes of their houses. There is the illustration. The little fox. But each spring, the pond came back to life. The melting winter snows and ice brought high water and the beavers worked frantically, making their dam higher and stronger so that the water wouldn't sweep, sweep it away. And each spring, there were more beaver families with their babies and new beaver houses. So there's the illustration. Look how busy it is. Still cold, but it's, the ice is breaking up. So we know it's early, early spring. The birds returned to build new nests. The water quivered with young pollywogs and baby fish. Again, the mother deer picked their way through the carpet of spring flowers to bring their new fawns to drink. But slowly, slowly, year by year, things changed at the pond. The ever running stream brought more fish and water. It carried with it fine dirt, which settled on the bottom and little rivulets of muddy water drained into the pond every time it rained. As the years passed, the pond grew smaller and more shallow. It makes sense if the water is bringing dirt, the dirt settles to the bottom and over the years that would cause the dirt to raise and raise and raise and the water would become more and more shallow. Little by little, the reeds and cattails along the shore moved into the water. At last, the pond grew too small for all the beavers. Farther and farther, they had to roam from the safety of the water in search of trees to cut down for food. That makes sense. Is that what you pictured? And the wolf, the lynx, and the wolverine grew bolder as they crouched and waited for their prey. So it was that in an early summer, off went the beavers down the stream to find a new place for their home. 
They left behind their long dam of sticks and mud and their empty beaver houses sitting in the water. No longer did their chirps and whistles sound across the pond. No longer did the sharp slap of their tails warn of danger. And no longer were the bustling beavers to repair the dam when the high, water, high spring water flooded the pond. What will happen now if they've moved on? Will the dam still hold? And you can see there are no beavers. There are other animals though, still using that pond. But the other small creatures still stayed. The pond was big enough for frogs and fish. The dragonflies still zoomed back and forth and the raccoons came cautiously at night looking for crayfish. One early spring day when all the snow had melted, suddenly, there's the raccoon, slowly hunting. See how shallow it is? It doesn't look like it did before. When it's more shallow, then the plants can really grow up through it. What's going to happen now? Suddenly, a great flood of water came roaring down the stream into the pond. Over the old dam it poured and the rotted sticks and branches could not hold the weight. The torrent of water raced on down the brook and what was left of the pond went flowing out through the break in the dam. You may have guessed it pushed through. The water is very strong and it pushed through those old sticks and mud that the beavers left. Once more, the stream ran free. Bit by bit, the muddy floor of the old pond turned green. Young plants sprang up in the rich earth where once a pond had caught and held the blue sky. There spread a green and grassy meadow with a brook meandering through it. I like those words the author used, a brook meandering through it. Instead of just saying there was brook, there it is, much like the beginning. But farther down, the beavers had already built a new strong dam and a new pond sparkled into the sunlight. Frogs and fishes, turtles and hovering dragonflies enjoyed its waters. Red-winged blackbirds nested in its rushes as ducks paraded their babies proudly. And in the cool evening light, the mother deer brought their young ones to the edge of the pond to drink. So you shouldn't feel bad for them. They found a new place to go. There's the dam and all the animals using, using the new pond. The end. I hope you enjoyed the beaver pond and maybe you can draw an illustration yourself or write a story of your own about spring.